My parents and I were among the throng of migrants fleeing the bondage of Mississippi's sharecrotton cotton fields after World War II. In search of the promised land and orchards to work in fertile central California fields, we stumbled on to Highway 1 when we were young, us and the highway, evolving from a Native American footpath to a ranchero wagon trail, as it beckons pilgrim and pauper alike by the spell of harmony that bonds the marriage of land and sea it pervades. A thin place, Celtics call, and Franciscan Richard Brewer describes such edges as holy. Growth near nature's garden along the Pacific enriches formative years not ordinarily afforded offshoots of field hands. Greetings and welcome to this edition of In Our Community. My name is Lovie Spencer and I'm pleased to be your host. Today, for nearly 500 miles along that same Highway 1, with patchwork quilts of lettuce, Brussels sprouts, strawberries, and artichokes, planted and harvested for America's salad bowls on undulating hillsides and valley floors, relentless waves carving tide pools and coastline wind-swept cypress forming a backdrop which, nur which nurse nourishes fledgling ideas and non-perishing thoughts that move forward the mission of Father Junipero Serra, put pen to paper of John Steinbeck, sparked uprisings of Cesar Chavez for abused Braceros, and perhaps today impacts the ministry that calls our guest, the Right Reverend Mary Gray Reeves, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of El Comino Real, as shepherd to the Promised Land, <laughs> to a flock of just under 20,000 faithful pastured along its route. Welcome, Thank Bishop. You. What a treat to have you here, how, how great it is for you to, uh, for your visitation here at our studios. Tell me, do you like Brussels sprouts or would you prefer <laughs> strawberries instead? Depends on how they're done, I love them both. My mom does <laughs> them in a good way as well. We have to update that uh, introduction a little bit. Of course, this past Wednesday, uh, Father Sarah has been uh, canonized into, uh, uh, into the Catholic Church. And uh, earlier this spring, uh, we had uh, uh, people from our church that were bought into the, uh, uh, the calendar on the Episcopal Church to commemorate their work here. So we now have are working on uh, walking on ground that is sacred, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, saints have walked on mm -hmm. in this area. Also earlier this spring, we had uh, the uh, two of our priests from our church visit us and to work on the Cassie family and their uh, commemoration into, uh, into the church. And you were a part of that, uh, Bishop. Could you talk about your involvement with uh, the Cassie resolution and, uh, and that process of bringing them forward? Uh, in our church, in the Episcopal Church, we don't uh, canonize as um, Unipero Serra was canonized this week, which was a great blessing, a great cause, especially for us here in California. Uh, for celebration. Um, we, we call people saints, but we remember them as holy and sacred witnesses uh, in the world, and it is good to take note of people in our history who have helped to shape and form the community, uh, especially here in San Jose and Silicon Valley. We're such a forward-thinking 
uh, community that's very easy to forget about people that have uh, worked for justice. And not without controversy, I think it's important to note that uh, not everybody was pleased about Serra's uh, canonization, and probably we, if we dug around in the Cassie's past as well, for all the good they did, they were also uh, human beings. But I was uh, blessed to preside at the service for their honoring, and um, we had the mayor come and uh, give a proclamation, and um, also marked their tombstones, which was a very important uh, events coming up. We just have uh, arranging that to make sure that um, they are noted properly in the history of this place. To actually realize 150 years is very short time mm -hmm. is that the mayor uh, presented the proclamation to the great granddaughter of mm -hmm. uh, of the Cassies and the cousins that were there. Yeah. So this was a, f a very short period of time. We think about uh, this for 150 years, but you do think about the trials and tribulations that they went through, and uh, uh, for that time, for the work that they did. Did. Mm -hmm. It uh, it's it's really a uh, uh, an uh, an exciting time in our church mm -hmm. to recognize them and to uh, to give them their just rewards. A part of this uh, this same change has been uh, the um, uh, the actual uh, change of our church in terms of, uh, of how it is that we, um, uh, we look upon and celebrate these people. I think it's, it's in sharing with their background into the community at large about these, their activities in the church has been really a, an exciting thing. Uh, we received commemorations from uh, the state council member. We received commemorations from Cindy Chavez. Uh, all of these people have been recognized with their efforts. And so the community at large beyond our church are aware of what it is uh, that they do. From the San Francisco Peninsula, all the way down to uh, Pismo Beach, just south of that, mm -hmm. you really cover the waterfront. <laughs> How is it that you cover that waterfront? Uh, well, our diocese extends from Palo Alto to the bottom of San Luis Obispo County, and we have uh, 43 congregations in that space and a few schools and some other uh, organizations, so I drive a lot. I know the 101 freeway very well. I know where every Starbucks is located on my route. Um, I live in the middle of it in Monterey, and uh, so I can easily go south or go north uh, as needed. I keep an office in San Jose and one in Salinas. So, And then, of course, uh, the internet is a wonderful way to communicate, so I connect with um, members of our congregations, but also uh, other entities. We like to be in the community and to serve in the community, to speak in the community as, uh, as well as I am able. I've watched you transact business and you've got your electronic gadgets and toys <laughs> around. It's a different day, isn't it? It's a different uh, day. To, uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've watched you uh, experience some of your visitations that you do to some of your parishes. And uh, that's very much a part of the, uh, of your being in touch with, uh, with the, uh, with your flock as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the occasion of hearing one of your, uh, uh, your sermons, and in the part of the sermon you were talking about, um, that was, uh, it was a term that Flip Wilson's uh, mm -hmm. used, is that what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the sermon actually meant that uh, in your Christian journey is that you don't always mm -hmm end up going the direction that you are, that divine intervention intercedes, and that uh, you end up going a direction. But every time that you kept saying that, of what you see is what you get, I started look, thinking, I would always visualize Flip Wilson, mm -hmm. and I came and told you about <laughs> it afterwards. And I was most surprised to see you break into a Geraldine <laughs> and do that, 
what snap. you see and mm -hmm. the snap afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's it been a, a staple uh, growing up when people actually sat down at an appointed time and watched television. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes, and this man too in particular who was uh, who was very uh, talented and that we remember him. This has been a very uh, strategic time in our church. We have great things that are going on, and a lot of them happened at our triennial general convention that was just concluding. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all watched. Uh, it was uh, a number of things, both Supreme Court rulings coming down mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, activities, uh, uh, paradigm shifts in ours of how we do business. And one of the things that uh, we talked about. You blogged again with that, uh, those toys and you were saying that you had felt a shift in our church at that time, mm -hmm. that you had felt a, uh, uh, that we had moved into a different direction. Can you talk about that shift uh, that you had and observed? I think uh, what I was referring to is that it, the mood felt much lighter at this convention than it has in the last 10 or so years because we have been, uh, as a denomination, uh, heavily involved in the congregation, or in the conversation around human sexuality. Uh, and our church has really led the way uh, among denominations to, um, to full inclusion of gay and lesbian, transgender and bisexual persons, and uh, not without some very painful conflict. And, um, and we've, been, we've been in the thick of it, and uh, this last convention felt like we were emerging out of the, um, the most difficult part of the conversation. Uh, we made some decisions around our marriage liturgies, which made them uh, non-gender specific. And uh, we happened to be doing that, uh, scheduled to do it, uh, just a couple of days after the Supreme Court handed down their decision. So for some people, that was extremely difficult, and for others of us, we were uh, quite elated with that news. Um, so it felt good and light. I think, uh, you know, religion in general in America is in a, is in a place of great change in terms of its role in the culture, in terms of how it functions. Uh, for us as an institution, we're a pretty institutionally heavy church, and uh, we, we need to lighten up on that, lessen up on that, and to connect with more people. Um, I don't, I think that um, something like marriage equality is a place where we connect with the wider culture. Um, even the role of marriage in general, to consider it in our culture is, um, is to bring up a relevant question because the whole nature of marriage, why people marry, when they marry, how they marry, is, is, uh, is very much open now in a way that it wasn't ever. The, the lightness, I think, was uh, manifested in our presiding bishop's uh, sermon uh, at this time. I think that for those of us that know the church as the frozen chosen is that this convention there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of that uh, image that was put along the way and our and our presiding bishop who is a marine biologist who is mm -hmm. a uh, her own pilot her text for her sermon was Get up, girl. Mm -hmm. You're not dead yet. Yeah. And she was talking about our church. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about these experiences that you have just just mentioned here. Uh, I think it is uh, the parable that she uses on this. Could you tell us, give us a little background on that parable? It isn't actually a parable. It's actually a story, but um, in the sense that parables communicate a metaphor, a deeper meaning. Um, this story is about uh, two people that are interacting with Jesus, um, and one is a man who has sent uh, one of his staff to come and get Jesus to heal his daughter who is very sick. And at the same time that that encounter is happening, a woman reaches out and touches um, the hem of Jesus' garment because she believes if she can just touch that it will heal her. And she is a woman who's had a hemorrhage for many, many years. So these kind of like two healings happen simultaneously but in different places because Jesus goes with the servant who's been sent and when he arrives there this girl is uh, alive again having been dead. So Catherine, who's the presiding bishop to which you refer, uh, made that 
made that statement about, get up, girl, you're not dead yet. And uh, she's a very introverted person, but the way she said it was um, extremely light and fun, and, and we knew it was about us as a church to just say, uh, death is not death. And in our Christian faith, that is true, because we believe in resurrection, that there's, there's something more. So even in times of death, there's something more. Considering her, we were taken aback at the uh, at the presentation, and of course the time frame of 12 years was very significant as well, because it was 12 years ago that we consecrated our first openly gay uh, bishop partnered. in the church, yeah. a partnered uh, bishop in the church. So this has been a struggle. It's mm -hmm. been a, a struggle. It has taken its toll, but we're now ready to uh, uh, to move forward, and. In in that moving forward, what we have done is to have a very exciting election. And mm -hmm. we elected uh, Bishop Michael Curry, mm -hmm. who, uh, so the first uh, presiding bishop, the woman in the church, is going to pass her crozier on to the first black man to hold right. that position. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only was he elected, he was elected on the first ballot and that uh, if he were a politician, I would think that he would have a mandate uh, to move forward on that. Yeah. Tell me your reaction to that uh, election. Um, well, if, uh, Michael is the right person to be the presiding bishop. His uh, leadership, his, um, his emphasis, the way he uh, encourages and uh, energizes people in their individual spiritual lives, but also for us as a body, uh, is just a beautiful thing to watch. I mean, as a leader, it is just a beautiful thing to watch another leader uh, do those things really, really well. Um, he's a person that's great to work with. He's a wonderful listener. He likes to gather in lots of information and then uh, really speak um, in a visionary way that um, allows people to engage in a, in a bigger vision than just themselves. Um, the vote itself was uh, fast. You know, we were sort of sequestered uh, in, in the cathedral in Salt Lake City in Utah. It's just the bishops that vote for the presiding bishop, and so we had a ballot, and that was pretty much done in just a few minutes. So uh, we expressed our gratitude to the other candidates, and we sang uh, hymns for a long time, because we all have to sign a, um, basically a certification of election, essentially, and um, all the bishops of color signed first, uh, which was great, and then um, we all filed forward and signed our names, and then we waited while the House of Deputies received that news, because that's the protocol. And, um, and then Michael made an entrance over there to the House of Deputies, which was great, and came in the back door unexpectedly, and they were everywhere, people were waiting in the front door, and he came around the back, which was great fun, and was just a very emotional time. It was great. One of the first order of business, orders of business that he did was to uh, select a vice president of the House of Deputies. Uh, House of Bishops. House mm -hmm. of, of Bishops. Right. And uh, as it turns out, it was you. Congratulations. Yes. Thank Congratulations. you. Along with yeah. another, there are two of us. Uh, for the first time ever, there's never been two vice presidents, but uh, Dean Wolf, the Bishop of Kansas, and I will do that work together and um, reach a lot of people together. So your, your jurisdiction will go beyond uh, the Central Valley. Uh, tell us about some of the things that you'll be doing. Uh, well, mostly I'll be working with Michael and with Dean to um, support Michael's um, vision and the way he wants to get it out there, can uh, communicate that. A lot of our work will be done in the House of Bishops. We gather twice a year, so there's meetings of about 150 bishops, and um, Dean and I and Michael will work together to create those meetings and to set the agenda for those. Um, there'll probably be some pastoral work involved, um, probably maybe some travel, I don't know. He hasn't fully disclosed all of this to us yet, so. Uh, and it, I don't think he knows yet. It's a, been a, like a pretty much a whirlwind for him since the day of election. His message, uh, the sermon that he preached at General mm -hmm. Convention was quite uh, straightforward as well. Mm -hmm. The charge was to go, mm -hmm. and he looks upon his, uh, his ministry as what he calls the Jesus Movement. Yeah. And that uh, uh, in preparing for this, uh, I know the two of you have been on a similar commission into where you're restructuring the church to uh, so that it can uh, can 
actually perform better and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. in a more effective way. Can you talk about that restructuring? Yeah, we, we were on a committee together of about 24 people that were um, a pretty diverse group across the church, and then our job was to bring resolutions to the General Convention. Some of those were received and approved, and others were uh, referred for study, which is our way of saying we're not, we don't want to do this yet. Um, so, but a lot of the restructuring is just to pare down the institution. Um, uh, religion in America is in decline. Uh, mainline Christianity is in decline. So we have far too much structure. We have more than we need. Uh, and the structure that we have is not necessarily conducive to growth, to uh, moving people out of the church buildings into communities in ways um, that we really need to do in order to be uh, effective sharers of good news. And uh, Michael would call that the Jesus movement, is how we connect people to this person, Jesus, which for us as Christians is the way that we know God and the way we connect with God. And um, for, you know, we've gotten really good at being the church in, in its institutional self. And um, our skills at communicating the uh, personal impact of faith, um, the way to come to faith versus uh, some kind of intellectual belief, those skills are quite dull and they need to be sharpened. His manner of preaching is not dull at all. No, definitely not. I, and I think that people will uh, be taken aback when they see this Episcopal uh, presiding bishop and uh, how uh, the kinds mm -hmm. of sermon that he sermons that he delivers it's, yeah. is rather exciting. One of the interesting things that happened at the uh, convention was a combined, this bicameral legislative body of the House of Bishops and the House of Dep Deputies met together and that the focus was on the five marks of mission, which mm -hmm, was rather mm -hmm. unusual in that process. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, uh, this moving forward in the charge of this? One of the resolutions that the restructuring group otherwise known as Trek, uh, brought to the convention was to have a unicameral house. Uh, that was referred for further study because there's a long history of being very attached to having two separate houses at our convention. But at this convention, and we hope at subsequent conventions, we'll spend more time in the same room together um, talking because the, the, the views are very different from being a bishop to being a uh, priest, deacon, or lay person in the church. So one of the gatherings we had was to talk about the marks of mission, how we're living those out. And the marks of mission are a, are a global um, uh, understanding of how we live out the Christian faith within our Anglican worldwide church. Uh, and they focus on things like poverty and on um, uh, women and children and creation and uh, ways of living out justice in, in areas of deep uh, human and uh, earthly need. It was rather interesting that these five marks of mission were derived from the Anglican Consultative uh, mm -hmm. Council. So it means that we're all talking the same language Correct. and moving in the same direction. That's yeah. got to be rather, uh, rather interesting for that to happen. It is, but I would say that we're, we are moving in the same direction, but we are doing it in different ways. So we are respecting and actually celebrating our diversity. I mean, the realities are that the, the creation issues are not necessarily the same as they are here in terms of environment and the justice issues around that. So uh, it's really important. I mean, it's part of being Christian as you you uh, experience the presence of God, you live your values as a Christian, uh, not just in the church or in the body of Christ, but in your community. So uh, how that uh, connects with the relevant issues of your local context is important. I just coming back around to the Cassies who were so involved with uh, working with children, uh, children of color in this community, which most people don't think of, that there are many black people in San Jose or that there historically ever were or that there was ever slavery in San Jose. And the Cassies, one of the, the gifts that they give to us is highlighting that. Um, connecting that to now, uh, the Bay Area is one of the, the largest human trafficking places in the world, and that most certainly definitely includes children. Uh, as the Super Bowl comes up next year, which is going to be here, I'm not a big football fan, but I think I know that much. Um, human, the Super Bowl is the largest consumer of human trafficking uh, event in the world uh, at any given time. And uh, so that history, that 
uh, example of care for those who have the least power in our society comes right back around uh, today in a different uh, context, but right in the same place. Right in the same place. On November the 1st at National Cathedral, that stately uh, place in Washington, D.C., um, the investiture of the first black man in the Episcopal Church will happen. Mm -hmm. And outside the door of that majestic structure are the words, a house of prayer for all people. Mm -hmm. uh, We've worked very hard to include others in our church. Uh, presiding Bishop uh, Griswold Emeritus referred to that otherness. And we are uh, in the process of this investiture, are exampling that. Mm. How do you see our church expanding the tent, if you will, to include a broader a spectrum of otherness in our society. Well, I think the way to do that is to have a greater dialogue with just in our with our neighbors in our local community. Uh, church, like everything else in our culture, has become a consumer item. You know, so we go to the church we want to go to, uh, and we may bypass a whole lot of people that we never know. And um, for Christians, we believe in the incarnation, so we believe God is present to us. Uh, in Jesus. So God is present to us in the created order of this life and of this world. And yet, as Christians, we don't always incarnate our faith in the very places that we live. Um, so I think expanding our tent is simply about doing that. And expanding our tent means that, in fact, the tent is not just the church building, um, but it is a mobile faith that we carry with us uh, in everywhere we go. And it's going to be an interesting time of the perspective that you're going to have this really immersed into it and uh, involved in it and to bring some of that excitement back here to the Central Coast as well. Bishop, thank you so much for spending time with us. Our guest has been the Right Reverend Mary Gray Reeves, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of El Camino Real. My name is Lovie Spencer, and it has been my pleasure to be your host. Until next time on this edition of In Our Community, I wish you peace and lovey. Thank you.